come to our study this afternoon in Philippians chapter 2, and we will just read verse 8, one verse today. Um, I will read the word. If you're able, let us stand for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, today I'm going to talk about that verse and the significance of the death of Christ, which is something that... If I were to expound on uh, continuously for a thousand years, I could not reach the depth of the glory of the cross, the wondrous cross, as Isaac Watts called it. Paul said in Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world is crucified to me and I to the world. But what the scriptures say is glorious, the world calls foolishness. Paul laments in Philippians 3.18, which Lord willing will be able to cover in a, a few weeks from now, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Why is this? What is it about the cross that is the dividing line of humankind? We either cherish the old rugged cross or else we hate it with all of our strength and live as enemies of it, even whether we know that or not. Our study of the cross then must be of the utmost importance because it applies to every one of us and... As I've said many times before in the preaching passages that we may feel like we know a lot about, um, that we need to guard ourselves from being inoculated to the majesty of the words that we're going to read, uh, and, and that they truly do apply to us no matter if we are brand new Christians or have been walking with the Lord for 80 years. The word always applies to us, and especially when the apostle is going to explain the cross to us in the text. Like that's uh, something that I, it should always uh, capture our hearts, capture our attention, and uh, and be fresh to us. So let's ask the Lord to speak to us, give us ears to hear and hearts to understand and to believe in his word today. Let's pray. Oh, great and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending your Son, Jesus, to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, the life that we do not and could not live, and then to die the death of the ignominious cross for us to forgive us of our sin, to take our penalty upon yourself as our substitutionary atonement. Oh Lord, we cannot express with words the gratefulness that we have in, inside of us for what you have done for us. And even sometimes our hearts become dull toward this marvelous, beautiful thing. But let it be, as your Apostle Paul says, something which we glory in, 
that we would not glory in anything except for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we could not boast of our own accomplishments, but rather what Jesus Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And may that fact change and revolutionize our entire lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to draw your attention to verse 8 again. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The Apostle Paul had been writing to the Philippian church in the previous verses about the condescension of the Son of God, how the Lord left his throne in heaven, he humbled himself, he became a servant, he became obedient to his father, and now he says, he became so obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That word even is a key word in our text to understand what Paul is saying. Paul is telling us that Jesus did not just die for us. He even died on the cross of all things. Why does he say it like that? You ever think about that? Even the death of the cross. What is the cross? And in our culture, the cross is sanitized. It's something that people merely wear on a necklace or you'll see a baseball player maybe take one and kiss it if they hit a home run. Uh, it's been twisted by Satan. Satan, of course, twists all the beautiful images that God gives to us. Satan twists the rainbow. He twists the cross. He, he twists those things. And so the cross has been sanitized to us. Um, of course, wearing a cross isn't necessarily bad, okay? I'm not saying that. But we need to understand what it signifies. In the ancient world, crucifixion was a horrific, disgusting business. Usually, it was reserved as the supreme penalty against slaves and the worst sorts of criminals. I have some quotes here that I looked up, ancient quotes from uh, Romans and uh, one Jewish guy. Cicero wrote in 50 BC, Cicero was a Roman orator, he said, the cross is that most cruel and most disgusting of penalties. To bind a Roman citizen is a crime. Now, let me pause there and say, that's the reason why in Acts chapter 22, when Paul was bound and he was about to be whipped by the Roman guards, the, the soldiers, he said, are you going to do this to a Roman citizen? <gasps> well, what do you mean? What do you mean you're a Roman citizen? I had to pay a lot of money for my Roman citizenship. And Paul says, well, I was born a Roman citizen, all right? I'm from Tarsus. How he got it, how he was born like that, we don't really know. No, the scholarship does not have a consensus as to how Paul was a Roman citizen being a Jew living in Tarsus. However, he was that. And he makes that as an argument. Now, Cicero was writing 50 years before Christ was born of Mary. So this had already been an established practice that... Um, even, even tying up a Roman citizen without a very good cause is something that you just don't do, right? Uh, you could face terrible penalty for doing that. That's the reason why the soldiers were like, whoa, whoa, whoa we're not going to touch Paul, right? Because of that. So Cicero writes, to bind a Roman citizen is a crime. To flog him is an abomination. To slay him is an act of murder. To crucify him is what? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. That's Cicero. No fitting word that can describe so horrible a deed. And this was the Roman orator, the famous orator, who worked exclusively with words. All right, We know about Cicero over 2,000 years after he lived. Because he was so eloquent, and he's the one, as a pagan, who says, there's no words for what the cross really is. It's such a terrible penalty. It shouldn't even be in the, in the, on the lips or in front of the eyes of the people at all. And we're going to see what Seneca has to say about that. But 
In another place, Cicero writes, the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. So, it was well known at that time that the cross is the worst kind of penalty. Seneca, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll save Seneca for the last. Uh, Josephus writes this, The cross is the most pitiable of deaths. And then Seneca writing in A.D. 50 writes this. Listen to these words, A.D. 50. Can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree? I, mean, I only know one. Right? I only know one who's willing to be fastened to the accursed tree. Long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly welts on shoulders and chest, drawing the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony. Any man would have many excuses for dying before mounting the cross. That's Seneca. That's not a Christian. It's a pagan. Martin Hangel, in his book on crucifixion, writes, To Greeks... Romans, barbarians, and Jews, the cross was not just a matter of indifference or just any kind of death. It was an utterly offensive affair, obscene in the original sense, because the people were naked as they were crucified. The cross is the most ignominious form of capital punishment ever devised, naked, alone, Left to die in agony, the death of the cross was almost always not from the loss of blood, but rather from suffocation, because once a person was fastened onto the cross, their whole body weight would be pulling them forward as their arms were backward or pulling them down, and in order to get a breath, they would have to push up with their feet to take a breath, and their feet, obviously, are also fastened onto the tree as well. It's just terrible agony. And then slouch, slouching back down again until their pericardium eventually fills with water and they have a heart attack and die. Um, I remember learning as a brand new Christian. I learned about the cross and what the cross is and how... Terrible it was, and um, I had read in some book somewhere about the word excruciating, that the word excruciating literally means in Latin, ex means out of cruciatus, it's cross. So excruciating means out of the cross. And right after I had read that, I had my very first kidney stone, and it was horrible. It was pain like I'd never experienced in my life. And I went to the hospital. It was the first time ever I went to the emergency room. I thought I was dying. You know, there was a lot of blood and stuff. Anyway, and the nurse, obviously, when you go into the emergency room, they come in. And they say, well, what's your level of pain? And I said, oh, what, what, are, what are the numbers? Like, what is it from what to what? She said, well, one is like nothing. Ten is excruciating. And I said to her, I said to the brand new Christian, I said to her, Oh, it's less than Jesus' pain on the cross, so it's a nine and a half. <laughs> nine and a half. It's not excruciating pain. It's agonizing, you know, it's pretty bad. It's not excruciating. So then no wonder why the apostle writes in verse 8 of our text, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. He writes in 1 Corinthians 1.23, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. I want to draw your attention to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And starting at verse 23, 1 Corinthians 1, 23. 
and I want to read uh, 23 to 28 for you. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were many not wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. And the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not that he may nullify the things that are. Think about that. So in, in the context that Paul is writing, he's saying the despised, I, I assume he's talking about people because he's saying, consider your calling, not many of you were wise, not many were noble. You might have been outcasts in society, sinners, right? Notorious sinners. Uh, I'm thankful that he says not many and he doesn't say not all, right? There are some who are doctors and lawyers and scholars, right? But... Not many. There's not many. Many of the people who the Lord calls are not wise according to the flesh. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And the base things and the despised things. Now, that's an interesting thing, right? Base, despised, foolish. What does he say? We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. It's foolishness. It's despised. It's this idea of a crucified Jewish man somehow has something to do with me? Like, what, what are you talking about? Right? That same thing that we might hear today if we're doing evangelism on the street or with our relatives or friends was the question that people were asking in the first century as well. What are you talking about? You're preaching this man who is crucified. It's a stumbling block to Jews, and I'll talk about why, but it's foolishness to Gentiles. And so why? Why was it foolishness to the Gentiles? Well, because the Gentiles would say this. Our gods, which are the true gods, are actually gods precisely because they don't suffer like that. <laughs> right? They are immortal. You don't see Zeus going to the cross. Like, he won't do that. This concept of God who would take on flesh and humble himself to the point of death, even death, on the accursed tree, which everyone, even the Roman Cicero, says like, no, whoa, it shouldn't even be on the lips of a Roman citizen. And that's the thing that is on the lips of every Christian, right? Makes the Romans, the Greeks, the Gentiles, like, what is this? This is ridiculous. It's like a, it's like a message that doesn't make any sense to us. It's foolishness. Um, it's foolishness. Why is it a stumbling block to Jews? Because they did not understand Messiah's mission. That's the reason why. They did not understand that the Messiah had to suffer and die. Um, interestingly enough, in my years evangelizing on Devon Avenue, there have been many times when I've spoken to Jewish Orthodox people on the street who have said things to me like, um, you know, there, there are going to be two messiahs, not one. Uh, messiah Ben Joseph and a Messiah Ben David. One who's going to come and suffer and one who's going to conquer and reign. And the reason that they say there must be two messiahs is because we see two pictures of the messiah. It's not two separate people, of course. It's one person 
that the scripture in the Old Covenant is describing in two different ways. Because he comes twice. The first time Christ comes to forgive our sin, and the second time he will come to reign and bring peace upon the earth. And so, because there are these two seemingly, strangely, uh, almost conflicting pictures, unless you have the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand, like, okay, why, what is the difference between Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 63? Isaiah 53, he's pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, punishment that brought his pieces upon him and by his wounds we were healed. Isaiah 63, who is this coming from Edom? His robes stained crimson. It is I in, in my might of my strength. My arm is mighty to save. And it's the Lord trampling down his enemies. Like, what? These are two seemingly very different pictures. The suffering savior, the conquering king. And so when the Jews were preaching, Jewish believers were preaching in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, when they're preaching, they're, they're saying, the Messiah has come and he's died on the cross and he's risen and he's coming again. It's a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block because it went against everything the rabbis were saying. And People trusted the rabbis more than anything else. Um, there's some parallels, I think, that uh, we could make today as well. The Jews say this cannot be our Messiah because the Holy One of Israel is blessed, not cursed. I mean, it's very, very similar to the reason why Gentiles believe that the cross is foolishness. Why? Because the gods are blessed, not cursed, right? They have power, not weakness. And that's the main argument that they have against him, but it's also the very proof that Jesus is indeed who the New Covenant Scriptures say he is. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's the reason why when... Seneca writes, Can any man be found willing to be fastened to the accursed tree, long, sickly, already deformed, swelling with ugly welts on shoulders and chest, drawing the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony? He would have many excuses for dying before mounting the cross. Yes, that's true, Seneca. That's true. Christ could have many excuses for dying before mounting the cross. But he did not give those excuses because he knew that the cross was absolutely necessary to take the curse of mankind. Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. That's the reason Christ had to go to the cross. That's why he could not die until he was fastened to the cross. It had to happen. Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer, describes the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement in this way. He says, Christ took all our sins upon him and for them died upon the cross. Therefore, it was right for him to be numbered with the transgressors. Christ bears all the sins of all people in his body. It was not that he himself committed these sins, but he received the sins that we committed. They were laid on his own body that he might make satisfaction for them with his blood. That's Luther. Praise God. I, honestly, I can, I can say, though Luther had a lot of bad things that he said, I still respect him for a lot of what he did say too. You know, a lot of the, a lot of his theology was right on. Leviticus seventeen eleven says, "I have given you the blood to make atonement for your life." That's it. Isaac Watts wrote, "Was it for crimes that I have done 
he groaned upon the tree, amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. This is at the heart of the cross of Christ. This is the reason why Jesus died, even the death of the cross. And I would go so far as to say that a person cannot understand Jesus unless they understand his cross. His cross is essential. Ha, I might even say crucial. Right? Think about that. Think about how, uh, there's other words that, that we, we use that have the word cross in it. When we say something is crucial, what we mean is that it is central. It's a crucial doctrine. It's a central, crucial. Why would we say crucial doctrine, right? It's because the cross is so much in the center of Christianity. It's not something that we believed in when we were born again and evangelized and we moved past the cross onto bigger and better and, uh, you know, uh, let me learn how to have ten lessons on being a good dad now. Like, that's not what Christianity is about. We never move past this. This is the center of Christianity. What Christ did for us. His accomplishment. You cannot understand Jesus unless you understand his cross. The cross is the cost of our forgiveness. It is the only thing that we can ever boast in. Truly, it's the only thing that we can ever boast in. I mean, le legitimately. I have nothing to boast in. Um, because everything I have was given to me. Right? Everything you have was given to you. Your talent is given to you. Your strength is given to you. Your abilities are given to you. Therefore, you cannot boast in them. You cannot boast in your brain. You did not make your brain. God made it. You cannot boast in what you've done because the only reason you've done anything at all, for good or bad, the only reason you're even able to do anything is because God has decided that you should live. <laughs> like, that's it. And he has given you it. He's given you the blood in your veins and the breath in your lungs. It's interesting to me. It's so interesting. Like, I don't know if you saw recently, um, this last week, how this famous gymnast quit um, after she did a, a poor vault in the Olympics. Simone Biles, she quit. And uh, I'm not trying to, you know, critique her, down her, whatever. But I'll say this. She quit, and she said numerous occasions afterward that the reason that she quit was because she had uh, to focus on her mental health, and that there was just so much pressure on her to do well and to get a gold medal, and she couldn't handle the pressure. And so she got what gymnasts call the twisties, that's what they were talking about, that when you're flying up in the air, twisting around, and suddenly you don't know where the ground is anymore. And it's like, uh, you know, the greatest athletes in the world, like someone like this, they, their head messes with them, and suddenly they can't perform anymore. And so she quit. She quit the Olympics, and, and she had said that, you know, the reason why is, is because of, like, because... She's supposed to be the best. She's expected to be the best. And she doesn't know if she could be the best right now. And there's too much pressure on her. And Well, I mean, uh, so much of that has to do with pride, I think. It's just pride. It's like boasting in one's abilities. Like, what are you talking about? The only reason you can even do a flip is because God has given you the ability to do it. Now, you can't. Like, so what? You get a gold medal, you don't. Like, there's no, should be no pressure at all, actually. 
If you're boasting only in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, then it actually doesn't matter, right? If you're able to uh, be the best gymnast in the world. It doesn't actually matter. Not in the long run. Not in the deepest place in one's soul. It doesn't matter then. I think the, the only way that it could matter to a person is if, they've, if that thing has become their idol. Right? Of course, to get to that kind of a level as an athlete, I think a lot of, a lot of them, what, they've, what they're pursuing actually is an idol. And they boast in that. And they boast in the medal. Or people boast in all kinds of things, except for Christ. The cross is the cost of our forgiveness. It's the only thing that we can ever boast in. I have absolutely nothing to boast about except for what my precious, marvelous Savior has done for me. And so in discovering why the cross is needed in the first place, we have to dive into the character of sinful man and the character of God and his holiness. And part of the reason why penal substitution is rejected by most people is the offense that it necessarily brings to man's pride. In other words, the cross says that man's sin is so bad that Jesus Christ had to leave the courts of heaven and come down to earth to bear the punishment that every one of us deserves from the Holy God, this doctrine thus crushes our pride. And those who want to think that they have some meritorious goodness within themselves, when they look at the cross, they suddenly realize, like, no, the, the cross is saying you don't have that. The cross is saying this is actually what you deserve. You deserve to be where Jesus is. But he takes your place. A man naturally, man naturally wants to think that he has some meritorious goodness within himself, that his sins are not so bad, that God is not so holy, but only the cross displays how heinous sin really is and how holy and gracious God really is. Leon Morris writes, the wrath of God is real and we must reckon with that wrath unpalatable though it may be our sins my sins are the subject of that wrath if we are taking our bible seriously we must realize that every sin is displeasing to god and that unless something is done about the evil that we have committed we face ultimately nothing less than divine anger um, and god is actually angry with us when we sin particularly as unbelievers, as those who are not covered in the blood of Christ, the wrath and anger of God rests upon them. But Jesus is our substitute who takes that wrath on our behalf as our propitiation. This is what God has done about the evil that we have committed. Warren Wiersbe writes, In his holiness God must judge sinners, but in his love he also desires to forgive us. God cannot ignore sin or compromise with it, for that would be contrary to his own nature and law. And so God solved the problem in this way. The judge took the place of the criminals and met the just demands of his own holy law. Reasonably, then, the question begs to be asked, why does God consider sin to be so bad that he would need to send his son to die on the cross as our substitute. Why is sin that bad? Uh, you know, we, aren't we called to forgive our brother? I don't, need, I don't need Tim to sacrifice something for me if he does something wrong toward me. Like, why does God need a sacrifice? What, what's the point? Why does he need to send, why does God need to send his son to die on the cross? Jonathan Edwards illustrates four propositions about why sin is so sinful. Uh, I could go into an entire sermon just on this, but I want to be concise here. He gives four points. Here it is. Ready? First, every sin or crime deserves a punishment in proportion to the heinousness of the sin or the crime. 
That makes sense, right? Any crime deserves punishment that is equal to how bad the crime is. Okay, second, a sin or a crime is more or less heinous according as we are under greater or less obligation to the contrary. So that if one is, say, speeding down the road, you know, going 35 in the 25, you might get a ticket. But if you're going 100 in the 35, you're going to probably get a much greater ticket. <laughs> it's going to be much worse. So the second point is, sin or crime is more or less heinous according as we are under greater or less obligation to the contrary. Third, sin against God is a violation against an infinite obligation. And therefore, it is infinitely heinous, right? God is infinitely holy. He is infinitely worthy of us not committing sin against him, of our obedience, of our worship, of our love toward him, of our devotion toward him, of our fulfillment of his commands. He's worthy of all of those, and he's perfectly worthy of them. Infinitely worthy of all honor. But what do we do? We steal his honor. We glory in ourselves. We take credit for things which only he has done. We spit in his face so often. And since he is the infinite God, when we do so, when we sin against him, our crime then is infinitely heinous. It is worthy of an infinite punishment. That's the fourth point. Persons who sin against God are infinitely guilty, therefore, and worthy of infinite punishment, of, of, of the worst punishment, because of who it is that we sin against. So Thomas Watson famously put it this way. There is no little sin because there is no little God to sin against. Every sin that we commit is a big sin because God is big. <laughs> Talk about the uh, understatement of the century. Edwards goes on and he says, Sins committed against anyone must be proportionately heinous to the dignity of the being offended. God then, being infinitely worthy of our love, worship, devotion, honor, and obedience, and the natural man does the opposite of these things, it is no wonder that he stands infinitely guilty and thus deserves the infinite punishment, which is eternal hell. All right? That's it. Edwards is so logical there. It's, it's, it's perfect. It's perfect logic. I, I think that, that that argument for hell, for punishment for, uh, against sin, is, the, is unbeatable. <clears throat> A person really cannot logically argue against it. Um, and it is precisely here, then, that this doctrine of the cross becomes more glorious in our sight. Jesus took the infinite punishment for our sins that we deserve, and then he imputes his righteousness to us by faith. Like, how? You know, how? How? How did it? something inside of us naturally that rejects that it says I know, but no but no no I, I can't I can't I can't receive that it, it's all it's almost like when Peter says Lord you'll never wash my feet you know, like, what, 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 no, no, I don't deserve, I, I don't deserve it. That's right, that's right, you don't deserve it. What does Jesus say to Peter? I better wash your feet, because if I don't, you have no part with me. Right, we don't deserve it, that's the point, that's the whole point. That's grace. I don't deserve to be forgiven. And yet, Jesus Christ died for me. It's, it's beyond words, truly. It's beyond my ability to 
give thanks for that adequately. Uh, we'll spend eternity doing that. Uh, that's what we'll spend eternity doing, is glorying in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Um, there's no other doctrine that more forcefully proclaims the love of God for sinners than that he sent his son, Jesus, to take the penalty for our sins as our substitute. The evangelical gospel preacher must have this doctrine on his heart and on his tongue every time he preaches the gospel. Every time he gets up to preach, the cross of Christ must come through. It must come through. The love of God in Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done for us must come through. If it doesn't, then the preacher is not doing his job. And oh, how the church has gotten away from that and preached every other thing but that. It's like, it's like, then there's no power then. If, if you're not preaching this, there's no power. There's no point. Like, there's no point in even getting together and doing this outside of this. This is why we're here. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, is there anything greater than this that God should take your sins and mine and put them on his own son and pu punish his own son, not sparing him anything, causing him to suffer all that that you and I might be forgiven? Can you tell me any greater exhibition of the love of God than that? Like, there's really not. There's really not. Oh, how wonderful is the love of God. This doctrine of the cross should lead all Christians to say with Horatio Spafford, my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And so it's no wonder, then, why Paul would say, I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Right? I've always said it's very interesting that um, when in, uh, what is it, Acts 20, when Paul leaves the elders at Ephesus and he says, I have not failed to proclaim the, the whole counsel of God to you, so my hands are innocent of your blood, right? Like he says that to the elders in Ephesus and, and he's, he's saying goodbye to them and they cry because they know they're never going to see him again this side of heaven. And, and, so he preaches to them the whole counsel of God, he says. I've not failed to give to you the whole counsel of God. But then, to the church at Corinth, he says, I desire to know nothing of laws among you except for Christ and him crucified. So does that mean then that to the Corinthians, he only preached Christ and him crucified, but to the Ephesians, he preached the whole counsel of God. Like, hey, you know, he gave a lot more to Ephesus than he gave to Corinth. <laughs> no, no. It's because the whole counsel of God is related to this very fact that Jesus Christ was crucified and risen for us. Right? That informs every doctrine. That informs the Christian life. That informs uh, and, and empowers, you know, the way that we live toward others, the way that we... Uh, read our Bibles, the, the, the way that we raise our children, you know, the, the way that we uh, uh, welcome strangers, the way that we forgive our enemies, it empowers all of those things. That's the reason why I don't need to do a series on how to be a better dad. All I need to do is preach Christ and Him crucified. That's what I need to do. And through the text, of course, and see what the text is saying and follow it and expound on the Bible. But the center of the Bible is Jesus and what Jesus has done for us. And that informs life. That informs life. And if we have Christ and Him crucified as a focus of our heart, it has the power to, you know, over, overcome any sin. It has the power to reconcile any enemy. Um, 
it has the power to heal a marriage. It has the power to forgive, to enable forgiveness, you know. It has the power to do those things. It's the center of the Christian life. Um, and Christ still bears the wounds. That's some, I think that's, you know, I haven't been to heaven yet, but uh, I, I think that the most beautiful thing in heaven are the wounds that Christ still bears. That, you know, he's risen from the dead in his resurrected body, and he tells Thomas, take your finger, put it here. Look at my side, right? It's that beautiful painting. Is that by Rembrandt, where, where Thomas is like looking and going, oh, see, you know, <laughs> I'll trust you. <laughs> it's, be it's beautiful. I mean, it's a beautiful depiction. So Christ still bears the wounds for us. They, they're the, the emblem, the eternal emblem of why we will be with him. When we're there, like when we get to see him face to face, and we see what he's done, the emblem of what he's done for us, I don't know. I, I just, I just think, I think we'll melt, you know. Um, it's no wonder why Paul would say that. It's no wonder, you know, why the apostle Paul would write that he glories in nothing but the cross. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win his erring child. He reconciled and pardoned from his sin. Jesus came for sinners. That's it. He came for sinners. He calls sinners. He came for those who by the Spirit of God understand what kind of person they are in the sight of God. And so we must examine ourselves. Do we think that we're all right? Do we truly think, like inwardly, do we truly think that we're all right without this mighty act that Christ does for us? Or do we know what kind of horrid sinner we are all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have become like one who is unclean. And all of our righteous acts should be in quotes, really. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf. And the wind of our sin sweeps us away. If we know this, if we come to Jesus with nothing but our hopelessness and helplessness, he will not turn us away. He said in John 6, 37, All that the Father gives to me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Jesus died on the cross for such people, those who know and see their absolute need for forgiveness that only he can provide. And there are two great groups then in the presence of Jesus. Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again for us, and we must ask ourselves, are we like those Pharisees who said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Or are we like the tax collectors and sinners? Right. <laughs> That's it. That's it. We need to really think about that. Because it's easy, you know, to get cleaned up and to outwardly look respectable that's easy. Lots of people in the world do that. Still inwardly, they're wretched and wicked and, and filthy and not, they don't have their sins forgiven. They think that they're all right because they're outwardly clean, like whitewashed tombs. At our moments of pride and self-righteousness, we need to hear Jesus' words of rebuke. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And then when we're humbled, and we see our sins, we need to hear Jesus' word of comfort. I have come for you. I have come for sinners. Where do you find yourself today? I, um, I want to read to you something that 
Martin Lloyd Jones wrote. Um, I'll close with this. Um, when I was a young man and the Lord came and saved me, I'm not trying to put myself in the sermon too much, but uh, this is apropos, I think, for this text. I didn't know anything about any good books, and so a pastor who was selling his books, I went to his house and he gave me a book. I said, I want a good book on the cross. I need to know about the cross. The only books I had ever read that were Christian outside the Bible were like Max Lucado <laughs> and Philip Yancey, you know, and I, I knew that there was something deeper, but I didn't know what. And praise God, truly, Colin Smith once one time told me like, David, it is a, truly amazing that you were brought great Christian books. Like, yeah, that's true, actually. It's true. Because, and that's the hand of God. Because I could have gone on Craigslist, like I did, and someone's selling Christian books, and they go to their house, and they hand me some T.D. Jakes or something. That could have happened. And I wouldn't have known any different. And I would have read that and probably gone down that path then. But instead, I, I went to this guy's house, and I said, I don't know hardly anything about Jesus or the cross. I, I know, I believe he, he's God. Son of God, he died for me, he rose from the dead. I, I do believe those things. I don't really know anything more than that. I need something deeper on the cross. And he said, have you ever heard of Martin Lloyd-Jones? And I said, no. And he said, read this book. And he gave me a book, this gray book with the red crown of thorns in the middle. And it's called The Cross by Martin Lloyd-Jones. That book changed my life. And this is what Lloyd-Jones uh, writes in one of his chapters. He says, this is the amazing thing about the cross. It comes to such a person who understands how sinful they are. And it is to such a person above all others that it brings its gracious invitation. What does the cross say to you? I'm not speaking to that self-satisfied, self-righteous person at this moment. I've already spoken to you and I trust that you've seen yourself in all the horror of your self-deception. I am speaking to those who are on the ground, groveling in their utter helplessness, and with guilt and a sense of uncleanness and shame, having lost their chastity, their purity, their morality, their everything. To anyone like that, I would say, Jesus speaks to you with sympathy. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He had sympathy on them. And not only that, but Jesus says to you today that he's ready to accept you. The world picks up its skirt and passes by. It leaves you alone. It does not want to associate with you. You've gone down and the world is too respectable to have any interest in you. Here is one who is ready to receive you. Here is one who is ready to forgive you. Here is one who is above all gives you rest. Come to me, you who are who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. An end to this vain, futile, useless struggle. Wait, stop, give up your activities just as you are. Jesus says, I'm ready to receive you. In your rags, in your filth, in your vileness, rest. Rest in him. Amen. Amen. I read that book while I was working with my dad as a handyman. And we, in between calls, I'd pick up that book and I'd read them as we're driving in between calls. And my tears would stain the pages of it. So I needed that. That, it's just like it opened up, it opened up the reality of who Christ is and what he really did for us, and what he did for me. When the Apostle Paul writes here, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And when David writes that the blessed man meditates on the law of the Lord day and night, I think we then will be blessed when we meditate on this. Even this evening, as you, before bed, you know, Go home and have some quiet time to meditate on the word. 
and just meditate on these words. This is my, my exhortation to you who are here today. Meditate on these words. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for us. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your marvelous sacrifice on our behalf, the penal substitutionary atonement which you provided for us. We do not deserve it. We are uh, wretches in absolute need of your mercy and grace, but you give that to us freely, and we are so grateful for it. And we want to thank you even though our, we do not thank you perfectly and even though our words fall short and even though our hearts tainted with the flesh are still impure, we still say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of this. Thank you for the manifold blessings that Jesus Christ provides through the work that he did on the cross. Thank you so much. And thank you for the people here. And I pray that we would truly consider these things and let them dwell deeply inside of us and let them not depart from us. Let these words that Paul writes not never depart from us. What you did for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Two eighty three. That's a good one. Horatio Spafford. When he's like a Yeah. Mm -hmm.
depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has become his counselor, or who is first given to him that it might be repaid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.